All right, so what I did here is that I, uh, I opened up the, uh, the book data from chapter one. This is the obesity level by state, all right, um, data. And so uh, this is the example that the book talked about, but I'm just demonstrating how to do it in RGIS. Oh, Maggie, is, the, is it back in the, on the coast? Sorry, what? Is the, can you see my screen back on the coast? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, great. Okay. So, well, I wasn't, I heard y'all had problems with the projector. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, well, I just switched over to a different computer, so I was making sure that I was still broadcasting. Yeah, it's working. Okay, great. So, yeah, this is the, uh, this is the obesity uh, data for the United States uh, in RGIS. Maybe most of you have done something like this. You can open the attribute table and you can see the variable that we're talking about here is obesity. So the other variables in this table, including uh, the state, the, the state abbreviations, there's a subregion uh, uh, table here, uh, which kind of divides the states up into different regions. And then um, there's, a, and that's also categorical. So that level of measurement there is nominal, nominal, not ordinal. Um, can't or rank, you can't rank order the states unless you like, well, unless you like use something. You could rank order them by obesity and say these are the fattest states and the second fattest states and so on, or obese, I guess I should say. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about a few uh, different ways to do that. And so the first thing that I like to do, maybe it's just because I'm... Uh, is change this to a projected coordinate system because it looks really ugly uh, in uh, latitude longitude like that. So I'm going to change it to a continental uh, US, North America uh, continuous Albert. I'm going to ignore Alaska. I'm just going to zoom in. So I think that projection looks better in my opinion. Makes it look like you're actually looking like the side of a globe. And then, many of you have probably done this, but we're going we're gonna to make sure that we understand each of these. So under symbology, if we choose quantities, we're basically saying from all of the, from all of the interval or ratio of data, uh, I'm going to choose a variable. So it's only going to show me those uh, values that are interval or ratio. So I've got area. I've got obesity and vacancy. Vacancy doesn't look like it's got any data in it. It's all zeros. So I'm going to choose obesity. Okay. And then I hit classify. And we're going to look here. We haven't actually talked about this yet. We're going to talk about this later in the lecture. But, um, but what is this diagram that's too small? What is that diagram called? Anybody know? It's a histogram. So what are the uh, what are the axes on this histogram? Frequencies on X. Frequencies on Y. And then your variable is on X. So that's what a, a histogram is always like that. Well, I guess you could have a histogram that was pointed out this way and you could do the opposite. Right? But uh, most histograms are shaped like this. So you can see the distribution of the data. We can see that there's some there's some uh, states down here. Well, these are, this says one. It's, I know it's hard to read. This says one. There's some states down here at the bottom that have very uh, uh, low obesity. And then there's some states up here. Looks like one, two, three, four, five states uh, that would fill up in this, uh, in this highest category. 
Now right now it's set on natural breaks. We're going to change that to equal interval. So these are actually the breaks right here that it's creating. So these equal interval breaks just divide the range up. In other words, the minimum and the maximum. They divide the range up equally. And that's why they're exactly the same distance apart. So if we say OK, and OK again, the red states are what? Are we, the fit, are we among the thinnest? The thinnest, or are we among the fattest? Right? So, um, right. So looking at this map, which states are among the fittest, the, the thinnest states? In Colorado and yeah, Massachusetts, I think, and Connecticut, it looks like. So those, those um, using the equal interval uh, classification scheme, we can see that those are all in one group, and these are all in one group. The reason that grouping, the grouping scheme is important is that you can, basically, when people see things on the map that are the same color, or even just see groups of things, like if we group them different, like if we just put it on paper, these are the fattest states and these are the thinnest states and these states are kind of in between, um, people tend to associate them together and to form opinion about that. Now, um, looking on the map has the added bonus of like, people tend to like start to look at clusters. So we can say in the central uh, south is the the largest area, and then there's a hot spot of thinner people out here and another one out there. Let's look at a different classification scheme. That's equal interval. <coughs> oh, I forgot I uh, switched computers, so the, the lecture is not on this one, but. <clears throat> All right, so we're, we're right there. Okay, you could do equal interval based on the range. In other words, it's the high versus and the low. Or you could do an equal interval based on, on anything. I don't think our GIS allows you to choose just an arbitrary uh, range. Um, it, it always kind of forces you to use the minimum and the maximum. Uh, I, I don't think you can choose... But you could do it manually if you wanted to. You know, you could you could change these break values to, uh, sorry, 20, uh, 40. Well, that that wouldn't even work because it's too high. But you get what I'm saying. You could you could make arbitrary equal interval boundaries and plug them in yourself. That's one of the things about RPIS most programs is you can choose your own break values. So. Um, so, so we could just go, it might work better to go five. It won't even let me choose that. Maybe at the yeah, manual. Well, because it's below the range. Equal interval. Okay. Defined interval. Okay, yeah, that, that'll work. If I, I could just choose a defined interval uh, of 20, um, no, that's, that's too big, three. And it's going to, uh, to create equal intervals through the data. So defining interval and equal interval are almost the same there. Um, all right, so that's equal interval, not based on range. <clears throat> One of the nice things about uh, not basing on range is you can choose uh, values that, and they didn't do it this time, you can choose values that were, that were more intuitive, like round numbers, like rounded off class break values. Okay, quantile breaks. Um, quantile breaks are uh, actually, when you took standardized tests in, in school, uh, they might have told you what quantile you're in. Uh, a quantile is uh, that you have an equal number of objects or an equal number of, of observations in every category. Okay. So you set the number of, of uh, so if I change quantile, you set the number of classes and it divides your data up so that there will be an equal number of observations in each class. See how this says six? 
Well, since this says six, it tries to get one, two, three, four, and it's hard to tell, there's actually two lines there. One, two, three, four, five, six observations in there. That, that's just a coincidence that they're the same number. So there should be about six in now all these other categories. And it won't be exactly six because 50 doesn't get divided evenly by six, but there's about six in every category. And you'll see that when there's a lot, see when the count gets really high, the class range is smaller. It's smaller right there because the count is higher. number of observations. So there's there's one, two, three, four, five in that in that category. So almost six. Uh, that's the that's the highest category. Looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six in the second category. So if I say okay here, usually this produces a map <clears throat> that has a greater range of colors. Like it has it has uh, it produces some would say a more interesting map. Because it, it, it ensures that there's an equal number of uh, categories, in, I mean, equal number of states in each category. Now, sometimes if you have weird shaped units, that won't help because you'll still get, you know, all your big units might be one color and your small units might be another color. But if your units are about the same size, uh, then you'll get, you'll get a more interesting map. So here we would interpret. The, the highest values, those with the highest obesity, um, those are directly speaking, those are the highest one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are the highest seven. Or since we know there's, let's, uh, let's change the number of categories. So, something I can divide easier. So if we change the number of categories to five, what we can say is those that are red are in the top 20%. Those that are in the blue are in the bottom 20%. And um, then we've got the middle. The middle 20% is the uh, <coughs> is the yellow. And then the ones between basically the second lowest 20% or the second less obese 20% are these guys. So that's that's kind of the reason that you do that if you want to divide the data up. Uh, so that people can kind of see which uh, which category each falls into by percentile or not percentile quantile. If you had enough data, you could do percentile. Percentile means you divide them up into 100 categories, which is a lot of categories. All right, and finally, we've got natural breaks. Natural breaks is actually the default in ArcGIS, and so it, it showed up first. But I'll I'll set it back to natural breaks. And what natural breaks does is it looks for the largest gaps in the data and divides the categories up, uh, divides the categories up by those, those gaps. So here's the natural breaks uh, data. It doesn't look too different than uh, some of the others. Okay, so. Um, as the book points out, depending on the classification method used, outcomes can be quite different. Uh, even though some data uh, is used, the same number of classes are uh, created. So um, one thing that you have to keep in mind that, that map readers don't always keep in mind uh, is that the patterns that you see are um, a result of the classification scheme that you chose. That's what this is basically uh, saying here. This is unemployment. This is all right. Traffic procedures. We're gonna. T we talked a little bit about histogram already, right? Um, but uh, a histogram. I'll show show that again. This is the histogram colored differently. Um, uh, a histogram tells us about the distribution of the data. One of the things about a histogram, we already discussed, this was counts and this is the actual value. A histogram is almost, well, it should be equally interval spaces on the bottom. So the equivalent of a histogram on a map is an equal interval. 
map. This diagram has equal intervals uh, in what we call we call these we call these bins. So each bin has the same interval, and that way the counts make uh, make sense. They can be compared relative to to each other. They tell us about a uh, histogram. I'm going to make a histogram uh, in a second here. Uh, frequency polygon is taking the histogram and uh, first of all, histogram, let's go back to histograms for a second. Histograms can use raw counts or they can divide the raw count with, by the total so that they can be expressed as a percentage. In other words, here we've got a value that probably represents three, right? But um, if we, if we added all the histograms up, I mean, we said that there were 100 total observations. We could take that value 3 and divide it by 100 and we get 3%. So we can label this using percent, like 3%. You know, I'm, I'm using nice round numbers. So this would be 9%, this would be 20, 20%, this would be 40%, and this would be about 21% or 22%. Okay? So a histogram can be expressed uh, in both the, uh, the raw numbers or as a percent. Sometimes it's helpful to use one versus the other. <clears throat> no, so the frequency polygon is just the histogram uh, connected at the top. So you have, you have a polygon where you took all the points and you connected them up. And let's say you took the, histo the frequency histogram and you made the bins infinitely small. Like if you had really, like if you had like a million data points and you were able to make those, those histogram points really small, the frequency polygon would get smoother and smoother. But you have to have millions and millions of points to do that. So sometimes the frequency polygon is shown smoothed out, but um, just to get you an idea of what it would look like if you did have millions and millions of points. <clears throat> but we're just taking each of the and the area underneath the frequency polygon would add up to one, just like the, all of these together. If this was expressed as percentages, should add up to one. All right, another way of showing a distribution is through a cumulative frequency diagram. And this is actually a build on the frequency polygon. Whereas instead of following the, 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 uh, the distribution, what we do is, this isn't the same distribution, by the way. It would be helpful if it was, but it's not. Um, what we do is, as we, as we, this, is still, this is still the variable in question. As we move along the x-axis, we go to the first, let's, let's go to this one. So it's actually it's closer to this one than this map. Go to the first one, let's say it's 3%. The next one, instead of, <coughs> instead of going just to 9, we go to, this would be 9, let's say. We go to 3 plus 9. So 3 plus 9 would be 9, 10, 11, 12. So, so then we go to, to 12, and then we go to the total of this. So at the end, we get to 1. If, if it's normalized, it's not normalized. Here we're just using number of observations. So it's not normalized, we're just, just using the, the total. So they, these two tell you the same information. They give you the frequency diagram and the histogram. Same information, but presented in a slightly different way. <coughs> and then the scattergram, and we'll, we'll talk about each of these as we go through the chapters, and we'll get, we'll get more into each of these. So today we're going to focus on the histogram. Um, and the scattergram, we talked uh, talk about way later, we'll talk about uh, correlations and, and stuff. Uh, but the scattergram is one variable plotted against another variable. So in other words, uh, I should have looked up and made sure what this, these two variables were. Uh, but uh, we could have. Uh, you know, height and weight. 
height and weight would be related, although you know there would be there would be a little bit more differences um, in in terms of that. But that's a that's a scattergram. It's a fairly simple type of diagram, and you could look at a scattergram and determine, <coughs> at least qualitatively, how related two variables are. That's the purpose of a scattergram is to look at two variables and say, oh, well, those two values are related, or those two values are related. And sometimes the relationship isn't linear. Sometimes it might go like this, sometimes it might go like that, sometimes, sometimes it could go like this and then like that. Uh, but it helps if it's linear uh, for statistical purposes. All right, on that note, um, I'm going to, so let's look at this obesity data here. Uh, let me look at the data on the di on disk. I actually had this set up for a different data set, but this obesity data set might work better. C, temp, QM, chapter one. One thing, so one thing I'm going to do is uh, you can open up any, um, oops, I didn't mean to say recent, but that's fine. You can open up any, uh, any DBF file. Do you guys know what a DBF file is in ArcGIS? Okay. Um, a long time ago, ESRI decided to create the shape file. And when ESRI created the shape file, um, they decided to uh, use the, the data format that they decided to use for the, for the data part, for the attributes and the, the observations. Um, they decided to use the data format would be uh, a, uh, a format called DBase. Okay? And the extension for that is DBF. People don't use DBase software too much anymore, but it's still, um, it's still a format that gets used. And you can open up a DBF file, a DBase file in Excel. Has anybody used Excel before? Microsoft Excel? Okay. So I'm opening, I'm, I'm opening up this, uh, this data set in Excel. So this is the, the obesity data set. I just opened it up in Excel. Um, and you see it's the same data, right? Still don't know what vacancy means. It's just zeros all the way down. Okay. But we've got state name, we've got state FIPS, which is just a code for the state, the subregion, and finally the obesity level here. Yeah. Um, well, it's a different file format. So CVS, I mean, CVS is a pharmacy. CSV. I, I don't know if I said it or you said it first. I said it. Okay. All right. So CSV is, stands for comma separated values. You can open up a CSV file anywhere. Almost every file will read. I mean, almost any text editor or ArcGIS will read CSV files. And, uh, but a DBF file is the file format that ArcGIS needs it to be in as a shape file. Now, sometimes... ArcGIS, you get an, you'll get some ArcGIS data, and your ArcGIS data won't even be a shape file. It'll be like a file view database or, or something like that. So if you want to get the data into Excel, you'll have to go into ArcGIS and export it. You can export it as a CSV, or you can export it as a, um, as a DBF, or whatever you want. You can export it in lots of different ways. Well, so the DBF is still only the tabular information. See, there's no shape, there's no shape column here. But it's attached to the shape file. It is part of a shape file. So if, if I actually update, like if I change anything, it'll either corrupt it. Like if I change uh, 24 to 7, to, if I change 24 and I type in that, and I saved it, and I brought it into ArcGIS, then it would corrupt it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't even open. Um, because... 
it's expecting a numerical value for that column, so it'll freak out. But if I changed IL to, I, uh, to IS or something, uh, Illinois decided they wanted to change their their state abbreviation, it would work. It would actually open up an RTIS as IS. So I can I can change the file there. <coughs> so when I don't change the file, I'm actually going to go file save as and save this as an Excel spreadsheet. So I'm going to call it, uh, D this stands for detailed states dot XLSX. So I'm going to hit save. And now, um, I've saved that file as an Excel spreadsheet. So that way when I make changes, I don't mess up anything up. Um, so I'm going to use this as we go forward. Excel is very capable of calculating some basic statistics, which we'll talk about <coughs> in the next lecture. For example, if I wanted to uh, get the, the mean, which I think it's average, right? That gives me the, the mean, oops, the mean of that uh, column. So I can select a bunch of values, and now I have the average obesity. I'm going to move my thing. The average obesity by state uh, is that value, 26.7. So I could, I, could, I could then change this value here. Instead of, instead of calling it average, I mean, instead of calling that value just F54, I could assign a number. I could say average or a mean uh, obesity, mean OB. Right. So now I could create a new column called uh, STOB and say it's going to be <coughs> obesity minus the mean. And then just go down like this. So what I've done now is create a new column that instead of showing me just the obesity, I've, I've created a number. I don't know if I, maybe I should have called it, uh, sometimes I refer to this as like a, an, an anomaly, how different it is from the mean. So uh, for example, Alabama is 4.3 above the mean. Instead of just looking at it as 31, uh, whereas uh, I think I saw it's negative seven, but that's Washington D.C. Seven seven units below the mean, 6.3. That's, that's really big. That's a little easy to have. There's there's 6.3 units units below the mean, so that that might be uh, more useful in some cases to take the. Uh, obesity rate and look at it as a deviation from the mean rather than I can import this back into RTIS and then uh, use that as the uh, category. Now it would look really very similar on the map but the legend now would show those values instead of the obesity. It's not the standard deviation it's kind of a step on the way to standard deviation. We'll talk about standard deviation in a second. So let's switch back over to, uh, to that. We'll go to, to lecture four because we're going to talk about, I mean, sorry, lecture three, because we're going to talk about standard deviation. And so I'll show you how to calculate that in Excel. I mean, you could just calculate it, but I'll show you where the number comes from because that's important. It's important to know that uh, in order to be able to interpret it well. Okay, so here we are on chapter three. <clears throat> I'm just going to keep going like this because uh, that way I can switch back and forth faster. So here we're going to talk about a basic descriptive measures, a central tendency, and that, that things like the mean, basically being able to summarize uh, an, an action, a, a, sorry, a column of variables uh, and uh, tell us about the averages and the, the central units. They understand basic descriptive measurements of dispersion, that's standard deviation. Understand the concept of relative variability. Okay. And determine the, the value of measuring shape or relative uh, position. 
And then we'll talk about the effects of location data and descriptive statistics. In chapter four, we, we do we talk about descriptive statistics um, for spatial data. So it's kind of like a continuation. All right. So we're all probably familiar with each of these, um, but let's just talk about them really quick. Um, numbers that represent the center or typical value or frequency distribution. Those include the mean, the median, and the mode. Let's like quiz ourselves so we know which one is which. So which one of these represents the most often repeated value? Exactly, the mode. Which one of these is the arithmetic average? Yep, and that means we take all the values and divide them up. We take them all, we add them up, we divide them by a number. The median, then, is, anybody give a good definition? Yeah, the, the value in the middle, all right? Okay, that's great. So measures of dis dispersion, <clears throat> these are numbers that depict the amount of spread or variability in the data set. So this includes range, even quartile range. That's something that maybe we haven't, maybe, or maybe you have. Interquartile range, we already discussed what a, uh, what a quartile was. So the interquartile range is, if, instead of taking the, the value right in the middle, if we, if we took the value at 25% and the value at 75%, that range is the interquartile range. It's less sensitive to what we call outliers. So an outlier is an unusual data point. And sometimes, an outlier can really affect the range of values, and so it's more useful to express everything in terms of the interquartile range. And um, the standard deviation, the variance, standard deviation, we'll talk about what that means in a second, the variance, and finally the coefficient of variation. You guys probably have learned about standard deviation before and variance. What about coefficient of variation? Do you want to provide a definition for coefficient of variation? It's pretty simple, but we'll talk about it in a second. It's, really, it's actually really, really simple, but we'll make sure. Um, so when we talk about measuring shapes here, we're not talking about shapes like in the GIS context. We're talking about the shape of the distribution, okay? So um, there are two other measures that we're going to talk about today called skewness and kurtosis. Skewness is the symmetry of the distribution. So how symmetrical it is, and kurtosis is the degree of flatness or peakness. Because if it's really peaked, in other words, if there's a really tight cluster uh, about a certain value, that's kurtosis. So if the histogram has a really tight peak, kurtosis. Skewedness is if it's going to one side or the other. All right, so we, we covered this, and you guys answered all the questions great. So we'll leave that, uh, we'll leave that here. This, this, uh, this formula looks kind of confusing even maybe for the median, but uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do there is say that, uh, and you guys probably already know this, if there's an odd number of values, it's just the value in the middle. If there's an even number of values, it's usually accepted to take the middle two values and get the arithmetic mean for the median. That's the common, common accepted way to do it, and that's just the math to get the mean. And then this is the math to get the mean of all the values. So this is a, a sum. We're saying that it's the sum of each variable um, divided by uh, n, and n is the number of variables, or the count. All right, now uh, weighted mean may be a little bit, uh, <clears throat> what you mean is, is uh, basically every observation gets to count differently in terms of its count. In other words, the n changes for each observation. So it's calculated from, it can be used to calculate means from class intervals or class frequency. So if we calculated, um, well, let's say, let's say we wanted to calculate 
the mean obesity. Now, what I just did isn't completely valid. Anybody think about, is this, <clears throat> is this value the mean value for the whole United States? 26.7, is that the average obesity for the United States? Yes. Why not? Because there's going to be a different number of values in the class. Exactly. The classes in this case are what? The states, right? And there's so many more people that live in California than live in Mississippi. And California has, I'm just using California and Mississippi as examples. California has uh, kind of a low, they're, they're, they're on the low end, not the lowest, but the lower end of obesity. Mississippi's on the highest. But, use it, but they were counted equally here. Okay? Um, we don't have a column that represents uh, population, unfortunately. But uh, let's see if I can get that real quick. Um, actually, maybe I can just go like this. Population by state. All right, so I'm going to see if this is, uh, <clears throat> if this will work. I just copy and paste. Control C. I'm going to create a new sheet in Excel and paste it in there. And it worked. So I've got population. <clears throat> and I've got the rank. I'm going to delete the rank. I'm going to delete the one for all the United States. All right? And then now I'm going to uh, I'm going to take population and state. I'm sorry, I'm going to take state and I'm going to sort it by state. A to Z. Okay. So now Alabama has 4 million. That makes sense, Alaska. Okay, so I've just sorted by state. And uh, now if I take these two columns, oh, I'm going to go back to my other one, and I'm going to select everything. Actually, I'm, I don't want to select my, my mean. So I'm going to select everything but the mean. And I'm going to sort this data again. I'm going to sort it by state name, cell values A to, A to Z. Okay. So now I've sorted them the same. Okay. It's kind of like I'm going to do a join if I was doing GIS stuff. But what I'm going to do is just take this column and paste it right here. Okay. So Alabama, Alabama, Alaska. See how, see how both of those are Alabama, both of those are Alaska? Let's make sure that it works all the way down. Pennsylvania. Oh, something messed up. See how Oregon. So I've got one less. Wyoming. Actually, it. it uh, West Virginia, Washington, D.C. So I don't have D.C. in this one. No, I do have District of Columbia. Oh, yeah. I could, I could solve this, though, right? So I take Washington, D.C., and I change it to, I'll just change it to D.C., then it'll sort, right? Okay, so then I'm just going to choose those two columns and sort it again, and now D.C. sorts in the right place. Now, no, I have to actually spell it out, sorry. All right, one more time. So I'll sort this guy. And now I've got, I've got, a, I've got a, a column that represents population, and I've got a, popu a, a column that represents obesity. So now I can do what the, what the book and the slide talks about. So we can calculate the average um, from class intervals or class frequency. So we can use the population in the, in the value. Okay? So this will give us the, 
the the population uh, th this will allow us to weight the obesity by population and come up with a better estimate of the overall obesity. Now, in reality, what would have been nice is this, these obesity values must have come from people originally, too, but they probably didn't. Do you think that they went around and asked every single person in the United States for their obesity value? No, they didn't. They couldn't, right? It, that's, that would be impossible. They probably sampled these people, we'll talk about sampling later, but this is an estimate. And so in order to come up with the average obesity, this really is the best way to do it, is, is to weight them by population. So <clears throat> what we do to do that is calculate a new value called weighted pop or weighted obesity. And with weighted obesity, we would take obesity and multiply it by the population and fill that down. So now we've got now we've got uh, weighted obesity. It doesn't I mean that numbers don't tell us as much. And we take that and we get the sum of all those values. The sum of all those weighted obesities values. So there's the sum of all the weighted obesity values. Let's see if I give, do I give the formula? I don't give the formula here. The book does give the formula. Okay. But the formula basically involves taking, we still have to divide that weighted obesity now by the total. And what's the total now? The total is going to be the sum of all of the people. So we have this is this is now the n, the denominator of the mean equation. This is the numerator. This is this is the weighted obesity divided by the all the weights. The best way to say that. All the people. The sum of the weights. So here is the actual weighted obesity and you know, I knew, I knew this was happen. it's not actually that different okay so but that's 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 an accident right it doesn't necessarily not an accident that's just that's just this data okay it could have been totally different so like uh, let's say we did um, uh, we did some other variable um, Well, this, this, these data aren't, aren't population. They're, that's just the, well, it's, it's weighted by population index. I mean, you know, maybe they weighted by county when they were doing the Yeah, but it's still, it's still just looking at the population for that state. So this 31.4 is for Oklahoma mm -hmm. and so on. Okay? So those numbers aren't different, but they could have been quite different. This is the weighted mean. And this is the unweighted mean. And this actually has less meaning, okay, particularly when we're talking about data that's already a summary of the data. You need, you need to weight it by whatever thing is being represented. So like, you know, let's say we were, doing, um, we were doing a tree height, and we had average tree height by forest, okay? So I'm just trying to come up with, a, with an environmental or uh, a physical example. We had an average tree height by forest. Well, we would, it would be ideal if we knew the number of trees in each forest. Uh, but even if we didn't know that, if we knew the area of each forest, we could weight each forest by area to come up with an average tree height per area. Uh, and that would be, that would make more sense than just using uh, the, this value, taking each, because some forests are huge, you know, we're talking about like national forests, some are really large, some are really small, uh, and so uh, when you have enumeration units that are various sizes, this is, this is really important, uh, that you calculate a, 
uh, it's really important that you calculate a weighted mean rather than simply uh, an unweighted mean. Okay. Now, if we're dealing with the raw values, in other words, let's say we just, we actually surveyed, we surveyed 100 people in Hattiesburg and found their weight. And we came up with, we came up with an average obesity for those people. We would just use the plain old, the plain old mean. Okay. But if we, if we surveyed the, the people in, um, if we surveyed the people in Los Angeles, Hattiesburg, New York, and wherever, we wanted to come up with the average of the averages, we need to do the weighted mean. Okay, variability. Variability is the amount of spread in our variable. Spread can be measured in different ways. Okay, the simplest measure of variability is range, just the high value minus the low value. However, the range is really sensitive to, uh, to outliers. So oftentimes we use other values like quantiles. Quantiles are used to define intervals, portions, percentiles. In the interquartile range is data divided into four equal portions. So the 25th and the 75th percentile is the interquartile range. All right. Let's talk about how to calculate standard deviation. And then I'm going to talk about a specific type of... So um, you can, by the way, just um, calculate standard deviation manually. Let's do that first. So I want to calculate the standard deviation of those obesity values. Instead of, instead of F2 minus the mean, I actually calculate the squared uh, deviations from the mean. So I'm going to call those uh, squared. Uh, so I take each observation and I multiply it by that observation. So these are the squared deviations from the mean. So that, that's how you calculate standard deviation. That's the first step we calculate in the standard deviation. Well, I guess now the second step. So you calculate all the differences and you square them. And squaring the differences from the mean, they turn all into positive values. So standard deviation is always a positive number. You don't get a negative. It's a measurement of, of dispersion or range. So then we just take the squared, um, the sum of the squared values, oops, I calculate the sum of the squared values, I get 600, or 601.4675. That's the sum of the squared deviations, and I have to divide that by n. So I take that value and I divide it by the number of values. In this case, there are 51 values. So that's 11.79348. So that's the range. Not the range. That's the standard deviation, which is a measure of, of uh, relative variability. Okay? Um, now, in the book and in life, they make a distinction between whether or not something is a population standard deviation or whether it's a uh, sample standard deviation. If it's a population standard deviation, you divide it by n. And if it's a, uh, if it's a sample, you divide it by n minus 1. All right, and we'll get into the reasons for doing that, uh, doing that later. So the, we, we divided by n here. We have all 51 states. All right. So that is the standard deviation and the variance. The coefficient of variation, like I said, is really simple. It's just the standard deviation, which is this number, divided by the mean. Okay, what units is the mean in? I don't even know. Okay. It's obesity units. Let's call them obesity just saying, there's, there ain't obesity units. So 26.7 obesity units. What units is the standard deviation in? 
Yes, that's true. I made one error though. The square root obesity units right now, sorry. SQRT, we need to take the square root uh, of that number to get the, now they're in obesity units. So these are in obesity units, that's in obesity units. We took this number and we divided it by this number, so what units are these in now? If they were both in obesity units before, what units are those in? Is that number in, that 0.12? What did you say, Mary? Yeah, that's 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 good. I mean, that's it's a unitless. that's not right, but what's that? It's unitless. It's unitless. That's correct. It's unitless. Some people would say it's normalized. So this number here is an expression, a unitless expression of how much variability exists in the data. And so you can use that to compare different data sets and say. This obesity is more uh, is is more range. There's more range. There's more variability associated with obesity than there is with uh, maybe height or income or something. I don't education level. There's more variability in this data than, than, than this variable than there is in this variable. So that's the that's the reason for the coefficient of variation. It's actually pretty underutilized. It's a good statistic, uh, but it's not used often, very often. Uh, so that's, you can also multiply it by 100 because it does, it will always be between 0 and 100. So you can multiply it, or 0 and 1, so you can multiply it by 100. It's kind of like the percentage of variance, but not, I mean, you multiply it by 100, it really is. You could say 12.88 is the coefficient of variation uh, if you multiplied it by 100. Okay? So it's simply the standard deviation expressed relative to the magnitude of the mean. All right, that's, the, that's the standard deviation. The variance is the same as the standard deviation. We just don't take the square root. Okay. That's what this is in the formula. See the square root there? That's actually the standard deviation. That's this one. If we didn't take the square root, it would be just the variance. And one of the things that your book points out that is interesting is that the, um, the mean minus all the variables um, is the lowest measure of so let's say I chose a different number for the mean. I like not chose, but let's say I use a different number like 50. And I took 50 and I subtracted 50 from all of the values and I calculated the mean and the standard deviation. I mean, sorry, the standard deviation and the variance using that same number. Like, let's just let's just do that. And I'm going to insert a new column. Oops. Actually, I've already got a column right there. I'm going to call this. Uh, uh, example, and I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take it, and it's going to say that it's equal to obesity minus uh, I'm going to say 30. It's always going to be 30. Good. Okay. So then I'm going to fill that down. So this is always a BC minus 30 instead of OBC minus the mean. I'm going to fill this over because this, so this is going to be the, delete that value. This is going to be the sum. Oh, wait, I got to square these. Sorry. Does that work? No, it doesn't work. Okay. So I'll just go like this. So I'm, I'm squaring these values rather than doing it in two steps. F2. I'm 
and squaring all those values. All right, and that's the sum of the squares. So this is the standard deviation, but not really. It's the standard deviation using that other value. Okay, it's 4.79. So, we went through that exercise. I can use every number imaginable, but this, this calculation of standard deviation that I did using the weird mean, the, non, the not real mean, is always going to be larger than this. In other words, this value right here is the lowest possible value using the mean. Another way to say that is that the mean value is the value that's closest to the center of the, the it minimizes all of the standard errors, all the standard differences between the mean. And it's, it's the value that's closest to the middle of that. Any other value will produce a higher value Another word for like we use this, we have to use the statistic a lot. Um, this would this would just be the, the root mean squared error. If we decided that 30 really was the right value. This would be called the root mean squared error. So it's the value away from 30. Okay, but that value is always going to be hard. Any any arbitrarily derived root mean squared error value will always be higher than that value derived from the mean. So it minimizes it minimizes the uh, the standard the standard the the errors from the mean the differences the mean minimizes those errors the sum of those errors. So, so. All right. Um, we talked about we showed some distributions before. If a distribution is normal, it looks like this. It's called a normal distribution. Think of like this would be histograms histogram that peaks in the middle and went out. Lots of things are normally distributed, but not everything is, but lots of things are. But usually the sizes of creatures in this world are normally distributed. So like, you know, frogs are, frogs of a certain species are basically the same size. They get, they, some of them are a little bit smaller, some of them are a little bit larger. Humans are the same way, okay? Uh, lots of other natural, uh, things the, like uh, uh, the height of trees. I guess that's still the same basic uh, thing. But lots of things aren't necessarily this distribution. Like income uh, is usually not distributed like this. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's there's a, there's a middle class, and then there's a there's a, a long tail out here because people can keep earning or, or let's just say well. So people can possess lots and lots of money, but there's actually a floor on on what you what you can possess, and that's zero. So uh, sometimes there's a long tail going out this way, and then there's there's a middle class, and sometimes that middle class is different, different in different countries. And, um, sometimes there's not a middle class; it's just there's a bunch of poor people, and then there's a tail that goes out uh, here in, in different countries. But um, if if it is a standard deviation. Standard normal distribution, what it means is that 95% um, of the values are within two standard deviations of the mean. 68% of the values are within one standard deviation of the mean. And almost all of the data is within two standard deviations. Oh, sorry, sorry, three standard deviations of the mean. We can, we can further discuss the shape of a distribution by talking about its skewedness. And if you look at the formula for skewedness and kurtosis, um, sometimes they call these moments. And they're really just building on the formula for standard deviation. We still have the observations minus the mean, um, and we're still dividing them by n minus 1, but this time we're multiplying them by the standard deviation q. Same formula, we multiply it by the standard deviation to the fourth power. So we're, we're, just, we're just building on these uh, values, but what they do is describe how peaked uh, the, uh, this is a standard normal distribution, 
This one's more peaked and it has a, a higher kurtosis. Skewedness, it's hard to tell here, this one is skewed in this direction. By the way, it's the direction of the, the tail. Yeah. Did you have capital N minus one there? Yeah, th uh, that's the uh, s a sample would be N minus one. Okay, lower case N minus one. Well, yeah, I mean, usually you're more consistent. You use the capital for the population and the, uh, and the N for the, the, the lower case N for a sample to be consistent. But skewness is still using the same deviation. Right. But that's n minus one. Oh, that's s. So yeah, that's the, that's the, that's the popular. I mean, that that would be that's written as a sample standard deviation. But usually, when we're talking about a distribution, we don't have the population. But we could calculate the skewedness first, or either the population or a sample. That is that is possible. <clears throat> okay, um, so we can calculate statistics using uh, GIS. We could like select out a, a certain portion. So this example might we might collect uh, statistics for a certain watershed and get descriptive statistics for that watershed and compare those descriptive statistics for another watershed. That's just an example. Um, we need to remember that when we do this, watersheds, counties, whatever unit we're using, that we have this modifiable aerial unit problem, which I'm pretty sure I did bring up last week. But um, here's an example using Indiana, two different visualizations of Indiana. If we divide Indiana by um, counties here, we get a different map, even if the same variable is, is used, if we divide, uh, basically we group um, different, uh, um, we make different aerial units and we group these crop aggregations and we get a different story just because the data is grouped differently. Your book has probably a more simple than maybe I'll get uh, example where it just shows, uh, here I'll do it here. It just shows, like, let's say we had a population of a different ethnic group uh, that lived right here. And that was the, let's fill them up. So that was a, an ethnic group. And uh, if we decided to uh, separate out into these three categories and we made a map and we made a map and we, we basically said the percentage of these uh, this ethnic group in each category. Well this one would be really low, this one would be really low, and this one would be higher, a lot higher. So if we showed it on a map, people would say all those people live in, like, let's call this uh, town A, B, and C. All those people live in town B. But, if we changed so that we divided the population up like this, I mean, and, and we called, and, and this became town A, B, and C, and we tried to make a map of it, we would say, well, those people are pretty distributed in each of the three towns. And this wouldn't matter, like, this could be people, they could be a certain type of pollution, uh, they could be uh, trees of a certain species, no matter what they are, when we change the enumeration unit boundaries, we could get different answers. So if we just made a map of A, B, and C, uh, and we showed the, pop, the percentage of, of the population, this would get like 10%, this would probably be, you know, 25, well, maybe 20%, and this maybe be 15%. So it looked different, because on the other map, it would be zero, uh, zero, maybe 80, and zero, okay? So it's, it's different just by dividing up the enumeration units differently. And that's, that's what we refer to as this modifiable area unit problem. Okay. So 
Um, we need to be careful when doing spatial aggregation because looking at things at different spatial levels and scales can vary the descriptive statistics. Um, unemployment might tell a totally different story. Like, let's say that this re represented unemployment. I mean, we'd have a totally different story of the unemployment in each, each village uh, if the villages were divided up differently, when it's really a geographic issue. All right. Um, one of the really useful tools, I'm going to go ahead and pull this out now, for, um, for creating a, uh, for, for looking at um, range and means and medians all together, it's called a box plot. And uh, I wrote a little bit of, of code here that I'll post. I'm going to occasionally post Python code, but I don't expect you guys in this class to learn Python. Um, but Python has a lot of tools in it. Uh, one of the, the tools that Python uh, has inside of it is a separate module uh, for doing data analytics is referred to as pandas, not like the animal, pandas. Um, so pandas is a tool, and I think it's an acronym that stands for Python and, and Data Analysis. I think that's what it stands for. Um, is that it comes with ArcGIS. It's a free software package, though. So if you didn't want to install ArcGIS, you can go out and install Python and install pandas. They're both free. Okay. Like, and, and it actually is meant to kind of mimic a software package called uh, R. And R is a free, uh, also a freeware software package. But I know Python better than I know R. Uh, so um, uh, Pandas is a, is a tool that allows you to create something that they call a, a data frame. Uh, and a data frame is nothing more than what we've been calling a data set. It's rows and columns of data. And it can read an Excel file. It can read, uh, it can read a CSV file, like you said. It, uh, it probably can read other data formats, but uh, I use it most often to read Excel and CSVs. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's what I'm doing here is calling pandas. And then also another library that's installed with uh, ArcGIS, it's called uh, Matplotlib, and it allows you to create plots. And so this is kind of like a very simple recipe creating a few different types of plots, including a histogram, a box plot, and then calculate some dis descriptive statistics. <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and run this, and we'll talk about uh, the results that it creates. Um, so I'm going to run that module. For some reason, on my computer, whenever, it might, might be the same way on your computer, uh, whenever, it try, whenever it creates a graph, I get, I get that error. I just have to ignore it. It creates the graph just fine. All right, so this is the, this is the output. So I have a, a few print statements here. The first print statement just prints out the word column headings. So it just prints that, that, those words. And then it actually prints the column headings. This is a little bit different data. I want to run this on the obesity data in a second. But first, the data that I'm running it on now is, is in the... Yeah, it's in the, it's in this chapter, life expectancy, this one. It's called lifeclean.xls. Okay, so it's right there. Um, that's what I'm running on right now. So I ran it on there, and um, I, uh, what it does is it shows me all the columns that are in there. There's a column called country name, a column called group. Just, I divided the countries up into groups. I did it arbitrarily, though, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I could have divided them up into North America, Central America, South America, and so on. The nice thing about the OPC data is it's already grouped by uh, region, so we'll run on that, too. Then the country code, and then these are the um, life expectancy by year. So the life expectancy in 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, and so on. So um, if, I, if I type df.describe, it takes my data and it makes this chart. I mean this, uh, this uh, I would call it a table. It makes this table. For each variable, 
it gives me all the descriptive statistics. So I have the mean, the standard deviation, the min, I have the 25%, the 50%, another word for that is median, the 75% and the max. Okay? For each variable. For a group, it doesn't make any sense because the groups are just one, two, three, four, five. So just ignore that. But for the um, for the life expectancy values, those make sense. So this is the life expectancy value over time. 66, 67, 67 and a half, almost 68, 68, 68, 68, 69. So see how the life expectancy is going up by year. And I can see that really easily in the data just by doing the descriptive statistics. Okay? So I can see also that the, let's look at the median. The median is also going up over time. That's the middle value. 70, so on, okay? And then, I can calculate skewness and kurtosis, but unfortunately it doesn't show up in the descriptive statistics. So this is just for 2000. So the skewness here, they're both negative. And so, uh, they're both negatively skewed. In other words, the tail goes out in the negative direction. So there are some, there are some fewer countries, but there's a lot more fewer countries that have lower life expectancy. And then there's a, there's a, the mean is off to the right, okay? We'll see that when we look at the histogram in a second. So, um, then also the kurtosis, what this means is that if it's negative, it's flatter than it, than it would be if it's a normal distribution. If it's positive, it's more peaked. So let's go ahead and, because this code right here created a histogram. I created it in this folder here. So here's the histogram that it created. And it's not, it, it actually, you know, it's not extremely, but it, but it is skewed this direction. You can tell um, that it's skewed in that direction. See what I'm saying? Like there's, there's more this way than there is that way. That's why it's negative and skewed. And that makes sense. You know, there's, there's, some, there's some countries that have much lower life expectancy than the, than the bulk of countries because even even many countries that are what we would call uh, less developed have longer life expectancies. I, I don't know if you guys, you guys have taken those classes recently or a long time ago, but we, you probably learned that the reason why population is exploding in lots of countries is because we're entering, a, 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 those countries are entering a, a stage in the demographic cycle where they do have some access to um, medication and uh, and hospital care and things like that for prolonged life, uh, but they're they're still uh, you know they're they're still uh, using a lot of similar agricultural practices, wanting them to have as many kids as possible, and and so they uh, at some point when they're fully industrialized, they'll have you know if they if they follow the demographic profile, they'll have, have less uh, children and have longer life expectancy. So we've got some countries that have low life expectancies and high birth rates. Um, and then countries here fit in both categories that low uh, countries with high birth rates uh, but long life expectancies like India and China, well, not China anymore, but uh, they have lower birth rates, lower birth rates now, but uh, they, have the, they have longer life expectancies. And so, um, but in some countries like in, in Africa, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, still have lower life expectancies uh, show up over here. So anyway, that's why it's skewed in that direction. <clears throat> the kurtosis just talks about the peak, uh, how, how peaked it is. Now the skewness in the kurtosis is independent of whether or not, for example, we came over here and changed the number of bins. If we change the number of bins to like 10 and ran this again, that doesn't change the skewedness or the kurtosis because that's just looking at all of the data. So now if I look at the histogram though, I'm going to have 10 bins instead of 25 bins and the data looks a little different. Okay? But I still have that. And you could create a graph manually like this in Excel. It wouldn't be that hard. Divide the data up. Um, you could, do, you could use ArcGIS to help you. Um, uh, all right. So that's, that's that. Is there anything else I want to talk about? Yes, there is. 
All right, so this is a uh, by group. Now these groups don't represent anything. It's just arbitrary. Um, but uh, this is what we call a box plot. I like box plots. Box plots are helpful for looking at uh, values. And what a box plot shows is the minimum and the maximum. And then it shows the 25%, 50%, and 100%. 25, 50, and 100. 25, 50, and 100 values. Okay. It shows the, the, the four, this is the this is what we call the interquartile range right there. So it shows the interquartile range, and it shows the median in red. This is the default, and then it shows the minimum and maximum values uh, as these little guys. Sometimes, if there are values that are very far beyond the minimum and maximum, it will go even further and show those outliers as uh, stars or plus signs again. <coughs> All right. Now, one thing I want to do real quick, let's say, I'm just going to call this uh, file save as and change this to chapter one OB data. So I'm going to change this to the obesity data. So let's say you wanted to modify which data set you were working with. So let's read this data in instead. I've got to change this data a little bit. I'm going to say file, save as, I'm just going to put underscore OB here, hit save. In order for this data to be read in, I need to get rid of all these, this, uh, this other data that I've created. So I'm going to delete it. And then I messed up, though I don't, I don't have this data anymore, so I'll just, I'll just, actually I'm going to get rid of vacancy too, because it's not needed. I'm just going to clean the data up a little bit. In fact, I'm going to get rid of example. I'm going to get rid of state because it's a duplicate column. So now I've got all that information uh, in my data set. And I'm going to say file, save again. <clears throat> so I'm going to find that data set, which I put into chapter three, or sorry, sorry chapter one, obesity. And here it is. That's the data set that I want to read into Python. So I gotta change the path to be the path to that folder and the file name to be that file instead of life cleaned. I'm going to change the type of, make this bigger here. Okay, and so what that's doing is saying, okay, I'm going to get this this file instead of that file. It's still called, no, it's not called sheet one. Sheet one has information I don't want. So I've got to change to, say I want to get this data. So that's going to put the col column heading in that data. And I want to put the column, I want to print the obesity column this time. I'm going to change year 2000 to obesity everywhere. Okay. And then I'm going to change this word. This is just a label in the column. I want that to be obesity. And then... Uh, I'm going to change subregion. Actually, I think what I'm going to do is just rename this group because that'll be easier. I could also change everywhere where it says group to subregion, but that would be difficult. All right. I'm going to run this. I'm going to actually change the histogram to uh, the file name outputs to ob and run this again. And we'll see. It looks like it ran. So now this is this makes more sense because these groups aren't arbitrary. We can see the mean by different uh, groups. So uh, the South Atlantic, uh, something South, South Atlantic, has a 26.67. It'd be interesting to see which one of these mean which. So we decided that the the middle, the lower middle was the the, the largest. That's probably the east. South Central 
32. You know, there is a higher value than anybody else in terms of obesity. Yeah. All right, let's look at the uh, plots that I created. Oops. Then we'll go on to chapter four. Okay, so here's the histogram for obesity. So that's much more normal. Not, not completely, because there's a little dip here, but um, it looks more normal. And let's see if the... Uh, Oh, that probably didn't actually write over it. Let's see if in the output, uh, the kurtosis was, it's, it's still negative, but I think it's a smaller negative number. Yep, see negative 0.44? So this means that it's still, still a little flatter, but it's more, it's more closer to a normal distribution. The skewness is still negative, but look, it's, it's very low skewedness compared to, to this one. <clears throat> Point, point 0.8, this is point zero 0.03, much different, much more, much, much more of a normal distribution. So let's look at the box plot, because the box plot on obesity, <coughs> it's going to make sense now. So we can see uh, really quickly a lot more information than just looking at the uh, means for each of these values. Because the means for each of the values, we saw that the east, south, central was the highest. That's got Mississippi and everything. Um, but we couldn't see also the spreads of various regions. Look at how the South Atlantic, the South Atlantic probably, let's go, let's see what it has in it, because my guess is that the South Atlantic has part of the, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, that's still like these guys. These are the South Atlantic, maybe. Let's, uh, let's just, we can change the symbology to uh, categories. And look at the subregion. So yeah, that's the South Atlantic right there. So the South Atlantic has the most variability in obesity. Okay, so you've got states that are totally different from each other. Florida, and you've got a state that's probably pretty, uh, pretty varied even inside of the state in Georgia, because you know you've got a, and, and even South Carolina's got a lot of people that come down. You got North Carolina. You've got a bunch of different states here that are, that, are, that are a lot different than each other, I would imagine, in terms of their health and eating habits. Uh, so that's why you have a lot of variability there in South America. Pacific's got California in it. Uh, which one? Probably the mountain. The mountain was one. That's got a lot of variability there. Okay? It's pretty tight in the mountain states. That one had Colorado in it. It looks like the lowest median, though, is actually the mid-Atlantic. And that's the one that has Massachusetts and Connecticut. Okay. That's a box plot. And uh, box plots are, are, box plots and histograms are good uh, <clears throat> things to start exploring your data, besides just looking at the descriptive statistics. And then if it's spatial, map it on top of that. So those are all, uh, those should be the take home lessons from classification and descriptive statistics is that uh, those are good things to, to look at. I just want to pull up the histogram one last time. So there's the histogram for obesity. So you can see that. And we could change the number of bins. Obviously, uh, we only have 51 observations, so we can't change. As we, as we start to change the number of bins, we're going to start getting more and more gaps. If it shows 51 bins, we'd have just counts of one everywhere. See what I'm saying? That wouldn't be very good. So. The number of bins is dependent on how many observations you have. Let me close that up. All right. So, uh, hopefully we get through the last chapter here. <clears throat> uh, actually, where did I put it? Let's look at uh, files. Chapter four, lecture. Actually, download. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about spatial statistics. I may do some of the demonstration, like I just did some demonstration. I may do some of that next week. Um, so, uh, if, if we run out of time. But, uh, oh, 
I didn't want to do that. It does that weird thing. Okay. So descriptive statistical statistics. Sometimes this is referred to as geostatistics. However, sometimes that word geostatistics is targeted specifically at a, um, at a specific type of analysis called preview, which we cover in some other classes. But uh, I think, and lots of people agree, that geostatistics you know, should be more of a broad term. Um, so, uh, but sometimes we refer to this as just spatial statistics. So they won't be confused with, uh, with preview. Um, but anyway, uh, what we're going to talk about today is spatial or geostatistics, but specifically basic descriptive geostatistics. Okay? So they can be used to, to summarize point patterns and the dispersions of some phenomenon. That's what, that's what they're for. Oops, I skipped this one. Um, but basically, we're just going to be looking at both measures of spread and central tendency in a spatial context. All right? So the first one, and this actually works because of that. Um, remember I talked about before how the mean is it, it minimizes the square differences to all the values, okay? Because that works, this concept of a mean center works. Um, we can take uh, any, all the, any points in space, and what a, what's a point? A point has, at minimum, what attributes? If, we're, if, we're, if, we, if we reference that point in some coordinate system, what does it have at least? An X and a Y, right? And sometimes people like to use uh, um, latitude and longitude as X and Y, and you can do that. However, be aware that doing so isn't really, you can't really calculate the difference, the distance between two uh, latitudes and longitudes. You have to convert them first to a Cartesian coordinate system, like UTM or state plane. And then you can calculate those numbers back. Zero really doesn't make any sense. Uh, so it's best to convert them to a Cartesian coordinate, or what we call projected coordinates in, in geography, uh, in order to do those. But the mean center represents the average center of a number of coordinates. So if I have a bunch of points, and I take the average x value and the average y value, then that number is, because it minimizes the distance to all the x's and the distance to all the y's, that number is what we call the mean center. It's the center value uh, of those. So that's what we call the mean center. It's pretty easy to, to calculate. Uh, and uh, when I do the demonstration, there's an ArcGIS a routine for doing so. I still have ArcGIS open, right? In case I don't get to the demonstration, uh, if you look under uh, Arc Toolbox, under Spatial Statistics, uh, and then you go to Measuring Geographic Distributions, we're going to talk about a number of these. Mean Center is what we've talked about so far. So Mean Center takes the average X's and the average Y's. So you need to know how to calculate that. Um, and you're going to calculate it manually uh, in the lab, uh, but you can do it not manually uh, in ArcGIS. So let's say you had a bunch of points. So if we try to run that, I don't think it's going to let us. Yeah, it will. So if we if we do it on on something like states, uh, it's going to. Uh, take the center of each state and calculate the mean distance to each state. The output is still going to be a, oh, I don't even know if it's going to run, actually. Because ArcGIS is smart. Let's see if it runs. Okay, it did run. Okay. Um, but we are using decimal degrees here. So like I said, we should probably convert it. But this is the mean center of the center of all the states. So that's how that works. You can, if you look in, uh, maybe I'll just do the demonstrations as they go along. You can, if you look at 
all the uh, out here, you can't actually weight it. You can weight the calculation uh, of the center by uh, some field, like population. I don't know if that's already a shape file. If it's not, it would take too long, but let me, let me see if it is. So under chapter one, this is the example in the book, so if, if it doesn't work. Then that's fine. So we have the population. We have the population in um, 90, 80, 2010. We have changes. Um, so if we wanted to calculate for any of these population values, if we wanted to calculate the average pop limit, here, let's just do that. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to X that out, and we're going to, we're going to calculate two different things. So we're going to calculate the mean center just based on this other layer. Okay, and then I'm going to calculate the mean center, and I'm going to use one of the population values, the population values in, I think it's, I forget whether it's, anyway, it's like a long while. Why don't we just use 2010? Because we know that's 2010. Population in 2010. So here's the, here's the mean center according to uh, just the center of each state. And here's the, the center of population, weighted by population. And notice that it's in a slightly different place. Let's make sure I got was right. This is the second one, yeah. That's the that's the that's the center. That is the population weighted, or sorry, that's the mean weighted by population. That's just the mean of all the features. You could do it by case, like uh, if you filled out a case field. Well, here. I'll show you what that does. We're not going to fill out a. We're going to look at the. Uh, we're going to look at. No. We're going to look at the centers of each of the regions. So now, I'm just looking at uh, the centers for each region. So these are the center. That's the center of the mountain states. That's the center of the upper Midwest, the lower Midwest, the. Uh, Southeast, the other one over here would be the South Central, and so on. Okay. And then the Pacific's actually going to be out here because uh, Alaska is in the Pacific. Let's see if I zoom out. There's the Pacific. Okay. All right. So that's mean center, and you can you can use lots of tools. Here's here's showing the mean. Uh, this is similar to the data that we had here, showing how. The mean center of population has been changing over time. So it started out, or started out there, and now it's moving over here. Uh, and we, I did 2010; it was already like right here, it's shifting up, look north a little bit, jogging north a little bit. Okay. The weighted mean center is this is actually the weighted mean center, looking at the the center of population. So instead of just dividing by n, we're dividing by the sum of the weights. Okay. Remember, I, I mentioned that this works because of that least squares property. Okay. Um, there's a concept called the Euclidean median. Now, the Euclidean median is sorry, the Euclidean yeah, the Euclidean median. The Euclidean median is much harder to calculate than the, than the just middle value. There is a tool for doing that. It's called Median Center. Okay, your book talks a little bit about how to calculate it, but it kind of leaves it out too. It identifies the location that minimizes the overall Euclidean distance. So the difference here is that it doesn't minimize the squared difference, which the mean automatically does that. It, it, um, it minimizes the overall straight line distance to each point. Not the square difference. So basically, the square difference is weight, weights closer points more than far away points. So we could do uh, 
we can do the um, this one, and let's just do unweighted. Just say okay. I'm just gonna make it unweighted. So this is the uh, Euclidean center. So this is the Euclidean, the median center, or the Euclidean median of that value. So it's usually a little bit different than uh, the mean center, but it's actually it's act actually times sometimes more useful uh, because if you were trying to place a store. Uh, and you were using walking distance. If you were using like distance on a network, like usually, like let's say you're trying to place a store in New York, though, and so it was always based on walking distance, then the median center would be would be better than the mean center because it would it would weight everybody's walk equally, no matter if they walk far or not far. And, and so um, it's uh, that's what the, uh, the mean the median center is. That's the Euclidean median. It's, it's often used in economic geography problems. That's what I was trying to get at. So it's searching for the best location. Okay. Standard distance. Standard distance is similar to standard deviation in the descriptive statistics. It measures the amount of dispersion in a point pattern. Okay. Let's see if I can find some point data here. Uh, Actually, well, yeah. well, here I got some USA data. So let's look at these are the cities. Let's open up. The cities in uh, in Nebraska. A B C D U H J K L M N N B. Oh, N B has got to be before. Nope, I guess I sorted them the other way. And. Is Nebraska not NB? Let's just go like this. Select by layer. Cities, state, equals, oops. What is it? Okay. Oh, N E, right? Yep. Just, just uh, the wrong postal abbreviation. All right. So now, if I, if I calculate the, uh, see here, I've got the standard distance. If I calculate the standard distance, and it should only calculate Nebraska's here, I can, I can decide whether I want to do one standard deviation, two standard deviations, or three standard deviations. I'm just going to do one for now. So here is the standard distance for the cities in uh, Nebraska. Okay, um, but if I change the cities that are selected, select by attributes to Utah, maybe, and then reran that tool. Oops, sorry for there. Cities. So it's basically calculating the standard deviation for both X and Y. And you can see that the city's over some size in Utah are much more compact than the cities over the same size. So I've 
looking at this, and also they, they follow a lake. So uh, Utah was basically settled in these three valleys, Cache Valley, Utah Valley, I'm sorry, Utah Valley, and Salt Lake Valley. So they, they came out here, they settled these two valleys right along the foothills of the mountains. And this is all a big desert. There's a couple of towns down here, St. George, and probably Cedar. Uh, whereas Nebraska uh, is a flat place. And so they kind of settled everywhere. It's more arid out here than it is out here. Uh, but they settled kind of everywhere, and the standard, um, the standard distance reflects that. It's much larger, they settled all over the place. Whereas in Utah, they settled in a specific place and left most of it, uh, rest of it empty. So you can compare the standard distance of two places uh, in, that, in that manner. So the amount of um, absolute dispersion in the point pattern. So, Do you use one standard deviation when you frame that For both of them, I used one standard deviation. So that Uh, well, um, it should mean that if they're like normally distributed, I don't know what that means for spatial statistics. Uh, okay. but, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I guess, right, probably if they were normally distributed, you'd have you know, kind of a cluster around both the X and the Y, and then they would, they would disperse out. So, um, yeah, it looks, like, it looks like we do have most of them, I mean, that makes sense, most of them within one set. So that's that's the standard distance, um, but it is it is just what it is is the standard deviation this way and the standard deviation this way, and then we put an ellipse around it. Oh, oh. One standard deviation in the x in all the x values, and one standard deviation in all the y values. So it's similar to um, that, that, that is what, what I just described it as. This one is a little bit different because it actually, um, it says in the description here, creates a standard deviation ellipse to summarize the spatial characteristics of the geographic features. And instead of just doing X and Y, it, uh, it actually go, does a, a, a standard deviation about the entire data set, and so sometimes it's, it's, it's rotating in space. So like, let's say we did this for, if we do this for Nebraska, it's going to be fairly different. Uh, Nebraska. Oh, we still have Utah selected, so I'll run selection, select by attributes. I don't know why I forgot Nebraska's postal co or postal abbreviation. So cities, one standard deviation, and uh, yeah, see how it's. It looks it looks like this more because the the shape of them is, is more uh, aligned to this direction. So this is a very simple formula, the standard deviation. It looks at the, the standard deviation in the x and standard deviation in the y. Uh, this one uh, tries to follow the, the pattern of the data. The direction of the data. And I don't believe that one's talked about in the, the book. All right. Um, this is the... Uh, looking at uh, Manhattan distance versus the Euclidean distance, and Manhattan distance is just like uh, the, uh, the distance along the block. So the Manhattan distance would be the distance here and here instead of that. Now they're, they're related because we know that this square plus this square is equal to that square. But you can calculate uh, Manhattan distance. Uh, I forgot where it is, though. I'll, tr I'll try to find that for next time. All right. <clears throat> Finally, um, 
there's the uh, coefficient of variation question, like how do we calculate something like coefficient of variation? Well, there really isn't a, a clean way to do it. You can't take the mean center and divide it by the, uh, the mean standard deviation. I mean, sorry, the standard deviation of x and y. It doesn't make uh, any sense. It, would, uh, it doesn't produce results that can be interpreted well. Um, one thing to do is to, is to actually just look at the, the standard deviation values themselves. Although it's not numerical, you can compare uh, the dispersion uh, ellipse in both cases and say, well, this is a lot different than that. It's like, that's like twice as big or three times. You can quantify how much larger it is uh, than, than that one. Um, you can do uh, things like that. Um, one of the things that's often done is that uh, um, if you wanted to measure how compact all these dots are, like let's say, let's say we had another identically settled area, but it was more spread out, okay? And so this was just a scaled version of that. In other words, this circle looked exactly the same, but just larger. And so we wanted to normalize that. We wanted to say, okay, well, I want these two to have the same value. One method of doing that, that I won't be able to do right now, is to compare this to a circle of the same size and compare this to a circle of the same size. And if they're, if they're very similar to a circle of the same size, then we can say that they're compact. In other words, their x and their y directions are, um, are equally as dispersed. They're, they're dispersed equally in the x and the y directions. So that's uh, one uh, method. Comparing uh, a, um, a standard deviation ellipse to the radius of a circle the same size, uh, that, that can be used as a that's also used, actually, incidentally, in comparing, like, let's say we had two different shapes, two different polygons, and we compared a polygon to a circle of the same size and compared how much different area there was. Let's see if I can just, I should, I should have brought something on that. See if I can do a visualization of what I'm talking about here. Yeah, so. So the area. Yeah, the, the same area, exactly. I'll bring an example of that next week. And that's actually not even talked about here. What we're talking about here is comparing this ellipse to a circle of the same size. Um, yeah, to the area. Okay. All right. Uh, so the kind of take-home messages here are geographers should look at geostatistics and spatial statistics very carefully. Interpolation can be, interpretation can be difficult. Um, uh, the center for, the mean center for high-income areas could be in a low-income area, in other words. Uh, for, for actually a lot of cities, uh, the way that they develop in the United States is that there's uh, there's a there's a uh, higher income area outside of the center, and sometimes they exist everywhere on the outside of the center. So away from the center of the city, or even in a ring shape, the mean of those high income areas could actually be in a low income area, uh, which wouldn't be correct. Okay, so when you're using uh, when you're using spatial statistics like mean center, you need to be be careful how you're interpreting that a value. And, and, uh, so geostatistics should be used as general indications general indication of location rather than precise measurements. Uh, most of the time, with the ones we talked about today, you need points. And you, you, these work on points. But you can 
take the center of a polygon and use that as a surrogate for a point, which is what, what, what I actually did when I ran the population. Okay. Um, and we'll talk about point pattern analysis actually later in the course, a little bit more, and polygon pattern analysis. Here's some, uh, some other I examples uh, that you can draw from. That should say ArcGIS 10.2, the Spatial Statistics Toolbox, not 9.2. Um, so you know, there's a Wikipedia article on it. This is the author of the, uh, of the workbook. He's the co-author of the book. Uh, he's got a bunch of cool courses. Um, he goes around the and talks about it. And then here's another example. Java out thing. Okay, uh, that basically restates uh, everything um, similar to the way I've already said it. There is this tool. That's, this is the tool I was pointing out. It's not, it's not 9.2, it's 10.2. We talked about, oh, we didn't talk about central feature. And that central feature is another way to think about the median. It's actually the, the feature that's closest to the middle. So instead of coming up with a whole new point, it says which of these points is closest to the middle spatially. So some people would argue that's similar to the median. Some people call this median center the median because that one uh, does something slightly different. Oh, and we didn't talk about linear directional mean. I'll probably talk about this next week. Um, but uh, linear directional mean takes a bunch of lines. Your book does talk about this, so go read the book on it. Uh, the lines like hurricane tracks, maybe, it comes up with a, uh, an average direction that those lines are pointing. So it's linear, a statistic, a spatial statistic. All right. All right. Uh, let's see if I've clogged up my hard drive yet. It looks, it looks still good. So I'll go ahead and um, I'm going to put this video recording of the lecture. I'm going to put up, all the data is already up there, uh, but I'm also going to put up those Python scripts uh, that I used, and I'll put up the, the histogram so you can see what that looks like uh, on Canvas.